good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's listening on the, uh, uh, the webinar today. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the 10th GVF webinar program. And this particular topic looks at global transitions, the digital economy, digital infrastructure, and connected communities for a digital planet. Uh, this is a fascinating topic that covers a whole plethora of societal transformations, which we'll look to explore today. Um, this, this particular uh, series has been supported by uh, Satellite Evolution and KenCast, and we're really grateful to them for, for their sponsorship. I think they're, they're two organizations that really do help to drive the vision for the future uh, in terms of the satellite communities and the, and the services that could be delivered. So. Um, what we're going to do today is to introduce the subject and uh, explore it uh, in some depth uh, before we open the floor for panels. So I'd like to introduce uh, three uh, of my panelists today, the three panelists. They are um, Hank Zbierski, who is the founder and CEO of Isotropic Networks. He's based in the United States, but has a, a global presence. Um, Sandeep Kumar uh, from Telstra. He will introduce himself, so they're based in, in Australasia, of course, and David Jensen from UNET, and he's, of course, based in Europe. So we have a truly global perspective today, and we've got uh, all of the different experiences of these different uh, organizations and the people and, and the things that they've done over the years, which will be, uh, be they'll bring to life for you. So I'd like to first introduce them one by one, and I'm going to start with, with Hank, who's uh, first in the, in the list. So Hank, would you like to introduce yourselves and say a little bit about why you think this subject is uh, so fascinating? Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Hank Zbursky, uh, Chief Catalyst of Isotropic Networks. This has been um, uh, dear to me from the very beginning of Isotropic 29 years ago. Um, the digital divide, basically the haves and the have-nots when it comes to knowledge, commerce, information, and um, connectivity of the planet. So it's a very intriguing subject. We experience it, um, the effects of it every single day. So I'm very happy to share what uh, we have seen. Thanks, Hank. Uh, Sandeep, do you want to say a few words about yourself and Telstra? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> so my name is Sandeep. I'm based in, in Australia. And obviously it's nighttime here. It's uh, you know starting of the new day, actually, te technically speaking. Uh, so Telstra is a tier one telco, uh, the main telco in, in, in Australia, uh, but Tel Telstra also has uh, interest in 20 other countries that we operate internationally. Uh, we have, uh, we have had, we operate one of the largest fiber network in Asia Pac, but we also have a very strong satellite business. Uh, so I represent the satellite business and I head that business. Um, it's, uh, this business is all about providing connectivity to be the service providers that we, we facilitate in land, water, sea, and we have a number of uh, enterprise customers that we connect all the way from uh, Pacific Islands to Africa and, and uh, North and South America. Thank you. And David, would you like to introduce yourself? And... Sure, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. My name is David Jensen. I'm with the UN Environment Program. And as was mentioned, I'm heading the Digital Transformation Task Force of UNEP. I also work on uh, the management of natural resources in fragile states and conflict-affected contexts. Why is this interesting uh, to me, digitalization? Well, you know, basically, we have about 10 years left to achieve the sustainable development goals and to deal with climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. And we're not going to get there in that time frame unless we have a massive adoption of digital technologies and we begin to move at the speed and the scale that digital technologies offer. Uh, so I'm really excited to start leveraging these technologies to, to achieve, you know, climate action, biodiversity action, pollution action, and to also think about uh, the downside of, of technologies. You know, how do we make sure that we mitigate the impact of those technologies on the environment? So how do we make sure those, those technologies aren't doing uh, more harm than good? So we have to look at both sides of this equation, and I think it's an absolutely fascinating space, and it's really the future uh, for sustainable development. Thanks. Well, thank you, David. Um, so just 
quickly about uh, Catapult, Satellite Applications Catapult. We're a research and technology organization independent in the UK, and, and we look at all aspects of satellite services. So what we um, have witnessed is there's a real potential transformative power of accessing satellite data and using it to, to generate uh, intelligence and, and either for climate or for, for government services, but also for commercial organizations. But in fact, that data is useless unless you can get it into the hands of people that need to make those decisions. So the connectivity piece is really, really imperative in here. So really quite interesting to explore that. Um, so I think one of the things is just to reflect on really what's happening from a societal perspective and maybe what does it mean to be digitally connected and let's let's look at it in, the, in a contrast from the perspective of you know the digital connectivity in the urban environments and how that is changing behaviors societal aspects with healthcare systems education uh, the way e-commerce works and and map it to really what we see as as happening in the wider community so maybe david if you wouldn't mind giving that some thought and, and thinking about what do we need to do, or at least what would be the way in which we can be inclusive to make sure that these uh, benefits to society could actually be um, brought to everyone? Well, let me go, let me go back to this, the, the question about connectivity and the things that are changing first. I mean, the way that I see it, we're, we're moving very much from kind of a, a, a command and control system of silos and pillars uh, to, to collaborate and connect. And I, what, what I see right now is sort of, four problems that we need to solve using digital technologies. Um, so the first is the data problem and getting to the point where we can actually monitor these challenges at a global level in an automated way, um, begin to be predicting problems and really begin to extract, you know, what's going on vis-a-vis -vis climate or biodiversity or pollution or whatever the variable we're looking at. We need a global view, we need it real time, um, and we need to make sure it's, you know, quality controlled. Um, once we have that global view, we need to push that data and that analysis to start influencing financing and markets, right? We need to sh make sure that the money that is flowing into the, the global economy actually reflects our goals and what we, you know, what we want to achieve as a global society. So we need to be looking at shaping those markets um, with that, with that data and, and those environmental analytics. Um, the third area then is looking at the supply chain of different products and services and making sure we can measure the impact of that supply chain. Um, and that has been a very big challenge so far. The complexity of the supply chain and all the variables in it, it has been almost overwhelming. And I think digital technologies are finally giving us the chance to look at a, the, the performance of a, a supply chain. And then the final thing is um, really shaping and shifting and informing consumer behaviors so that consumers themselves can be able to identify and select uh, much more sustainably developed uh, products and services. And I think, I think each of those domains is becoming more and more connected. And that is, that's really a huge opportunity to start pushing sustainability across those, uh, those four pillars. So I see a huge opportunity to, to begin interconnecting those and begin really pushing sustainable values and, and, and our global uh, you know, climate, biodiversity and, and pollution norms into that digital value chain or whatever you want to call it. I see a big opportunity to, to do that. But as you said, uh, there's a huge digital divide. And even if we get part of that uh, ecosystem working well, we have to fundamentally connect everybody. Uh, and that has to be a major short-term priority is really investing in the infrastructure uh, to ensure that everybody can access uh, you know, the, the digital benefits. Uh, and if we don't do that, as, as another colleague said, we'll simply begin to magnify the divide and create haves and have nots uh, and leave you know half the world behind and obviously that would be a terrible outcome so we have to look at both you know we have to make investments in both of these uh, equally i think we need to you will come back to that whole aspect of infrastructure investment i think during the discussion um but one of the things i want to reflect on maybe sandy you can can reflect on this too um in terms of the demand for connectivity in different uh, communities and are you seeing are you seeing some trends, some shifts in the way people are, are using the digital systems to actually uh, uh, be part of the global community? Look, okay, absolutely. So, <clears throat> you know, across our business, you know, our business uh, has, has many aspects of that. You know, we have 
connect we provide connectivity to to um, to homes we provide connectivity to businesses to enterprise and if you see the spectrum from mobility to fixed line to uh, to internet to satellite we see that that uh, demand and and uh, uh, progress everywhere you know in, so so the whole point of Telstra is you know how we connect people and and, and uh, so so that's our core that's our core value right we we even though we specialize in asia pack and and we have seen the demand uh, has grown 150%. You know, we carry a lot of traffic on, on our IP backbone. And, and especially during COVID times, it has just spiked. So, so, so you know, the trend is definitely going up. And, and uh, you know, the consumption through video and, and everything people want to transmit now, uh, there's a huge spike in the growth. And, and you know, Telstra is, is constantly investing in infrastructure to cater to that spike, spike in demand because it has, it has become so uh, uh, unpredictable uh, but if you have the right network in place, you know you can carry to that uh, carry to that demand. Do, do you know what the uh, what is driving the demand? Is it largely business need, or is it uh, changing in patterns of consumption of of content or media? I think it's it, it's uh, it's everything, right? So if you look at from a consumer point of view, the 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 amount of content that we are consuming through through that means has definitely increased manifold, right? So if it is household, it is same story. I think if it is business, it is same same story. Now, obviously, COVID has changed a lot of th- a lot of things. Things that are being consumed in offices are is being now consumed at home. But you know, previously in our home, typically you would use more entertainment than, than productivity but i think now our productivity from home working from home has you know spiked so it is just you know everyone is carrying a home in the office so, you know i have two kids and a wife who is also working every you know we are just all doing work you know like seven eight hours a day or studying or something so definitely there is there, you know there is patterns of of consumption of video and there is pattern of consumption of other data uh, and in businesses as well, you know, even through satellite now, you know, we have customers who are trying to control their unmanned vehicles, for example, in, in underwater submarines. So the, the, it's, you know, the, the amount of, uh, you know, the digitization and through, through this connectivity is just, it's got tremendous amount of applications. So it's quite a- one thing, one thing to remember, satellite never sleeps. And you think about people would like to go away and, Let's go fishing in Alaska. Let's go fishing in Northern Canada. And the lodges up there, all they could ever think about before was, I would like, I don't need much of an infrastructure. I just want a little bit of something so that I can make certain that the reservations are booked and the people come, I know when they're coming and we can accommodate them. Now the guests arrive. um, They do not believe that connectivity is a privilege. They believe it's a right. So now were you were operating a data package that only allowed you to book reservations. Now these people are, you know, yes, I'm, I'm off grid, but that doesn't mean I'm off grid. I still want to communicate with my wife about the last episode of Ozark on Netflix because we're part of a community in there. So there is never enough bandwidth. Lifestyles have changed with connectivity especially in remote, you know, isolated areas. Um, how do these little airlines get their reservations and make certain flights are on schedule at and yellow knife and going up places beyond there? It's, you know, all via satellite. Yeah, and I, I don't also reflect on the fact that my kids actually wouldn't go to a place if they, wouldn't, if they couldn't be online because uh, they can't share their experiences and, uh, and be part of that, that community. Uh, David, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I like to sort of think about how a lot of the work that we work, a lot of the countries we work in are either fragile states or, uh, or they're in you know, lo- uh, lower income places where I think the demands for online access are, are different. Uh, in, in, in our case, uh, a big demand is, is microfinance and getting access to you know, small uh, loans and actually doing payments uh, through the network. And I think, you know, you can see that some of the applications in uh, Kenya, like M-Pesa, that is really, um, I think, where the mobile, the power of connectivity and the mobile phone really started to explode when you could begin to do these financial transactions uh, using the network. Um, I, would, I would say that in terms of environmental data and getting access to environmental analytics, it's coming uh, for, for farmers, uh, but I still think uh, it's... Uh, it's difficult to, to get uh, seamless access and to 
uh, get um, you know analytics in, in a manner that speaks to their specific needs. So what I'm trying to say is I still think a lot of the data is too complex, and I don't think we're visualizing it uh, and actually uh, pushing it into a very specific use case as much as needed. We're still kind of giving aggregate analytics rather than very specific ones for very specific use cases. So I think this will continue to grow once we can figure out a better way of, of, of tailoring those analytics to very specific communities and needs. Now let's come back to that in a minute. I'd, just, I'd like to, to pick up on your point previously with regard to the aspect of transactions as well and being part of that global economy. Um, I, I know that you deliver services over for both both Telstra and Isotropic over quite a wide area. I mean, Hank, can you give me a big experience of, of people really wanting to be connected so that they can they can actually be part of the global economy? Well, let's take it in a, base, a very simple form. In the United States, we have large retail chains. Granted, every one of them is suffering right now with COVID-19 and nowhere near the volume, but we have a large retail chain where we are strictly the backup to their terrestrial network. It's point of sale. They learned in their studies, and this is just conventional commerce, if there are more than five people in line waiting to check out, those people will drop the product they were going to buy, just leave it there, and leave the store. Either go somewhere else or maybe, maybe come back later. And they found studying that with those analytics that they need to have connectivity immediately so that all their registers are open, operating, there's nothing slowing down the point of sale. And I can imagine that's really true in the kind of uh, urban environment and, and the kind of immediacy from a, a consumerism perspective. Um, but, you know, there are places in the world where that, that problem doesn't exist, but many others do. And uh, where there is, you know, essentially there, there's value in the things that people can offer on a global basis, but they don't have a means of actually getting it into the, into the supply chain and uh, into the communities and actually making sure that there's an awareness. I don't know whether Sandeep or Hank, you've got experiences that. Sandeep, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Look, so, you know, uh, as I explained previously, you know, we provide coverage all over Australia and we also provide coverage internationally. And we see, you know, you, you talked about, you know, everyone wants to be connected now. So all those mining companies who were only able to, you know, uh, afford previously and, and consume a couple of megabits so that they can do business critical applications. All these, you know, companies now are spending money for crew welfare, for example, and they don't, they don't, you know, want two or you know, five megabits. They want hundreds of megabits, and now it has become a lot more affordable. And the latencies have changed you know, due to technologies and, and and new new constellations that are being being launched slowly. Uh, and and now uh, mining companies are consuming hundreds of megabits, and I think they will be consuming, you know, even more when it all becomes um, affordable uh, and it reaches everywhere. Uh, similarly, we see a lot of growth in, you know, comms on the move and pause. Now everyone wants to be connected, vehicles want to be connected, and now we can, we have the technology to support it. If you are going for bushfire, if you are going for reconnaissance, if you are scouting, you know, out, uh, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, providing first responder, you know, uh, activity, you, you want to be connected, you want to be able to transmit videos, it saves lives. So, you know, we, we, we run, uh, you know, air traffic control, for example, uh, you know, all airports are connected, you know, either primary or as in backup. So there is just you know, a tremendous amount of connectivity that you need in, in any country. I'd like to pick up on the point you just made about the, um, the uh, enterprise activities in remote in, uh, locations where there might be an aspect of um, corporate responsibility to the societies that they're affecting. And maybe David, you could reflect on that because you were touching on that earlier about how to make it commercially viable. Well, I think I've seen a number of projects and I don't want to pick on the mining sector. Um, but a number of uh, projects, development projects or, or extractive projects uh, where very few benefits um, are shared with some of the local communities. So it's very much extractive and not uh, distributive to some of the local communities. And I, and I think, you know, just, just offering some, some of the basic uh, benefits like access to electricity, to water, to some of the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure would certainly be a first step uh, to ensure that some of the benefits flow to some of those host communities. Uh, and I think you know the digital offering digital access makes a lot of sense. Um, so certainly, I would I would I would agree with that as a as a as a basic uh, you know a basic principle. Um, but I think you're you know talking about 
uh, enterprise uh, services is a little bit beyond uh, my expertise, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the other panel members uh, who might have a better background in, in enterprise architecture. Frank, have you got any views on this? Or about, uh, the well, I've got plenty of views on enterprise, but before I, I lose my thoughts on this, you know, let's talk about humanity and commerce. Um, we have an example, something we did. There's, a, there's numerous uh, indigenous people in Alaska, northern Canada, uh, the Inuits, the Eskimo people. They have some very unique things. We, my wife and I ran into a number of them at an event there, I think about six years ago. And um, they, it's, it's called Kiviyut. It's the undercoat of the muskox. It's an unbelievable wool that creates a fantastic product. It's, they make shawls, they make you know, scarves, hats, mittens, everything out of this. And these were um, elderly ladies and they were worried that the younger people were all leaving the village. And we're talking about a village of um, maybe 80, 90 people, you know, under 100 people. And when the young, you know, next generation leaves and the older ones are just left there to, you know, be put on an iceberg or whatever, you know, nobody's too happy about that. So we actually provided a VSAT for free that allowed them to become part of a co-op and market the products these ladies were producing. And all of a sudden, the everybody decided to stay. They had connectivity. They found out what's going on around the world. Uh, they're informed. They feel somewhat, you know, it's, it's self-esteem. I know what's going on. We all know more than we ever knew before. We're, we can now produce a product and we can market this product. People know us all over the world. Over a 1.2 meter antenna with a four watt block up converter that's you know held down by blocks of ice. It's a fantastic life for them and it's, it's, it's changed things. And we've done this in numerous communities and it's worked very well. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of what David said, you know, we, we have to take this it used to be data. Now it's, it's big, big raw data that we're taking and it's an infrastructure and it's algorithms and analytics and insight. And a big thing we need to consider in all this also is cybersecurity. The last thing you want to do is put together a, a wonderful system for someone in a remote area and they're vulnerable. Well, so, and then people would do that. That's a great story, and I think it does just, just show how you know you can you can you can do both. You can bring value without, and actually help to maintain societies rather than see them being destroyed. David, you you had a hand up. Yeah, I think one of the big problems that we need to solve is how do we bring together public and private data uh, to to do good, right? So how do we integrate different data sets? How do we license those data sets? Um, and you know how can we how can we drive that data to to some kind of positive action? I think this is a huge this is a huge problem, and and it comes down to sort of what's the what's the governance framework for for data? What's the international governance framework for data? And then more specifically, what's the governance framework for environmental data? Um, you know, like who owns it? How do you license it? How do you make it a digital public good? How do you combine private and, and public data together? You know, how do you make it accessible? How do you make it open? These are all really important questions. If we're ever going to use this technology to drive sustainability at a global level, we got to solve some very thorny uh, governance questions right away. Like in the next year, we need to sort out, you know, data topologies, standards, licensing, uh, mm -hmm. open, you know, open source, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Definitely, there's there's a need to really rally around agreeing on some key problems and some and some ways forward between public and private sectors. In fact, there's a couple of questions that have popped up that are very relevant to this discussion. I'm going to ask the, the panel to, to reflect on them. And the first one relates to uh, the potential exploitation of artificial intelligence machine learning on Earth observation data and the, the, the use of satcoms to make that ubiquitous and available everywhere. Uh, and this act of intelligence. So perhaps, you know, maybe each of you could reflect on, you know, the process, the role of automation and AI and, and how it might impact on people's lives and what we should do. You mentioned governance. I don't know whether you want to start, David, or Sandy, if you want to put your thoughts in first. I mean, I'm happy to reflect on the, on that first, on the first question about EO data and AI. What, what we've been doing 
um, is trying to come up with a global view of different natural resources and you know what's been happening to them over the period of 30 years that we have Earth observation data. Um, so we're using machine learning to detect, for example, forest cover, uh, water cover, uh, or you know fisheries uh, boat movements. Um, but we're using we're using machine learning to train it on what does water look like, what does forest look like, what does a vessel look like, and come up with a real not a real time but a near real time global view of a particular parameter. So right now. UN environment uh, is really focusing on water, global surface water. We're focusing on air pollution. Uh, we're focusing on biodiversity. Uh, and other colleagues and partners are focusing on uh, forest cover. And that is, that is like a huge transformative change to be able to look at the entire planet and, and in one view detect, you know, all, all global deforestation in the last three months or, you know, the loss of water in the last six months. Um, or the gain is phenomenal, and it's a massive step forward in terms of global monitoring, prioritization, and really determining if our global efforts are actually making any kind of difference. And I think that's really fundamental, getting that near real-time monitoring platform at a global level so that we can actually make sure that our global commitments you know, are actually uh, being met is, is huge, and I, I see that as a massive step forward. Yeah, thank you. I just I'd like to reflect on the aspect of not only from the, the government perspective and the kind of uh, the climate and global perspective, but the potential exploitation of the data to turn it into tax intelligence for for commercial purposes. That's what would probably drive the the, the take up and the exploitation. Any any thoughts on that, Sandy? Look, so, so so based on that, obviously, you know, as a telco, you know, our, our main underlying uh, capability is to carry that carry that data for others, right? Now, obviously, we are also responsible for you know secure uh, transfer of data and also protection of that data as well ourselves. So you know, we have put all those practices in place. You know, we have a fully. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, full throttle um, you know security operation center for example where where we make sure that we we protect customers data and also our own data because you know obviously all all carriers and telcos get get attacked all the time and we have to not only protect our own data but also customers data so so that's a full fledged business unit that we we operate uh, and in in multiple locations you know in australia and outside of australia and uk as well just just on security so just to protecting the data uh, and look, you know, and, and mature organizations, you know, like Telstra, uh, you know, we call ourselves, a dig I think we're a digitally mature company. We have, you know, grown and we have experienced it. You know, we also experience customer networks. And I think that's our core, in our core, you know, how we make sure that the data is protected. And, and it is by anticipating their needs and what's happening in the network. Uh, you know, so that, that's how, you know, we react to, to such, um, to such um, I guess, you know, data protection um, uh, and, and conservation. Uh, yeah, Hank, you mentioned about cybersecurity earlier as well. Well, yes, yeah, cybersecurity is extremely important, but what's more important is who your who your operator is. We protect all of our clients' data. Every bit of it is, um, is protected. We know exactly what's going on anywhere in the world with any of our networks and what the traffic is. Um, I can tell you a few years ago, we were doing nothing but commodities trading. I could tell you exactly where the market was going to go, what was going to happen when the witching hour came about between options and futures having to be rolled over. I could tell you exactly what was going to be happening in the market. We protect that. It's shared with no one. Uh, if we did, my virtual background would probably be a jail cell and uh, it wouldn't be virtual. It would be real. So, you know, it's important. We do not exploit any of the data. I could tell you, um, with a few keystrokes, what is the most popular Netflix series being delivered over our systems right now? And I can tell you where it's going. Mm. Well, I can tell you what regions they're going to, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Nobody in our company will. I'm, I'm not going to put provide your... unrivaled certainty, and we want to be certain that our clients' data is protected.
I think that's right. And David, I'll come to you in a second. Um, but actually, there's a link question here, which uh, actually is, it captures this aspect. It's, uh, and if I could ask it, and then maybe we could reflect on it, is what role do the social media companies, giants in the pursuit of digitization, have in using the data, the intelligence they gather, not only for their own revenues, but for performing strategic decision making and for assisting in international agents in, in pursuing some of these goals. And I think the aspect there that you've touched on uh, previously with regard to that, that privacy of the data, but also potentially putting it to good use. Maybe David, you could start on that one and give us your thoughts. Let me just give you two quick points. I wanna just go back to the last question first, just very briefly about the, uh, about the, the value added. What I hope we can get to is a point where we have kind of, in a sense, two domains of data. We have public and private sector collaborating on a set of digital public goods uh, on different environmental issues. So we get a global set of analytics on some issues. And then um, the private sector side of those partnerships can take those digital public goods and find ways of monetizing and adding further value to them. So I'd like to get to a point where we have a global set of environmental data and analytics, uh, which are public goods. And then you know, on, the ba on the back of that, you could, you could commercialize further analytical streams on top of them, but we, we as the UN need to get to a point where we have a global repository of high quality environmental data and that's gonna have to come from a private uh, public uh, coalition of actors. Um, now going back to the, uh, the question about social media, oh, there's such potential to quote unquote, uh, obtain analytics from social media on major trends, whether it's environmental trends, social trends, behavioral trends, whatever it is. Um, I see it as a huge potential if it's done correctly, and obviously if identity is protected and privacy is protected, that's a that's a treasure trove of potential information about what people are feeling, how the, you know what they're thinking, um, and and ultimately, I mean that's kind of the core part of where culture is being generated, um, and so how do we begin to to use social media to put forward uh, new norms around sustainable behavior, sustainable lifestyles. Uh, and these things, I think it's it's an important channel that we need to begin influencing and learning from. Um, so I think some of the work that Facebook is, for example, doing on uh, disaster response and looking to see, you know, how people are moving and, and making that uh, information publicly available is really fascinating. Uh, and, I'd, and I'd like to see, you know, obviously more of it. Um, and really, if we could have much more of a public private conversation about, you know, here are the questions we have. Uh, how can social media firms help solve them? I think that would be fantastic. Well, actually, I'm gonna... you know, can I give you some input insight there? Um, we can give you, I can give you very, very concise information. When there's a catastrophe, when there are floods, when there are tornadoes, hurricanes, the first thing that the victims of that want to do is get in contact with their loved ones, families and friends to let them know they're okay. Because that creates the stress and the anxiety all over the world with everybody's relations all over the world. So, you know, we've, we've known from 28 years of doing this with uh, companies that handle catastrophes, what the most important thing is. And believe it or not, it is letting everybody know we're okay. I think what's interesting here is if you look at uh, the, the, the role of these organizations and, and their increasing recognition that, that they actually need to, to respond to that social responsibility is, is fascinating. But actually, if you look at whether it's Facebook or Amazon or Google, they also recognize the need for connectivity. And in fact, they're investing in it and could be potential competitors or partners. I mean, and I'm going to ask uh, Telstra, actually, uh, you know, a major operator and of course covering the large areas of, of perhaps you could almost view it as, as wilderness, and, um, but also an environment where there's been a lot of experimentation with different types of comm systems. What are your thoughts are on, uh, on the likelihood that, that there'll be a whole new paradigm for connectivity in the future? Yeah, so look, I mean, yeah, obviously, as you said, you know, it, it is a bit of a wilderness, you know, it's a huge area to cover in Australia with not a lot of population. Um, but, you know, as, as the main telco and a corporate socially responsible organization, you know, Telstra is trying to connect as as many, you know, populated areas as they can, you know, it's, it's greater than 99% coverage. And now obviously with 5G, the coverage is increasing in, in more geographical spread as well. 
because 5G is all about, you know, not only connecting human beings, but also other sort of machines. Now, you know, just going back to the same, same sort of comment, you know, how we use, you know, I can't probably comment on, you know, how other social uh, media companies use um, data, but, you know, Telstra also has millions of customers and their data. But, you know, how do you, a mature organization use the data in a very safe and secure way? So just a little, little example, I can, I can quote you. So if you, if you were to travel to an airport in Australia, to an international, you will probably get a text from, from Telstra, hey, you're at the airport, you're traveling, you know, obviously to talk about, you know, what you can use your phone for, but also reminding you, that if you register with the, with the Department of Foreign Affairs, you know, your trip, then you, you know, you have the consular access, so it's just a nice reminder. So, so you can use it in many ways, and this is a good example of using data in a positive way and, and not in a commercially beneficial way, but, you know, being a corporate responsible organization. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's lots of, of examples uh, of, of where, um, where the connectivity makes a difference. One of the questions that's um, that's popped up actually uh, was related to um, the aspect of collaboration between the satellite industry and local communities, for instance, internet societies and um, so community representatives. I don't know um, whether whether that factors in any of the, the, the discussions you have. I mean, Hank, do you, do you see that? Do you actually manage to, to get access to, to community representatives and people working in this in the sectors? Well, we've never been able to do it with satellite owners or operators. We've had to do it on our own because uh, that's too small for them, even right. though it could be a state or, you know, if you look at now, um, all three B's come up with their product. They're pretty much a telco. They're lighting up cities. That's an entirely different market than we're involved with. We're more a corporate and, you know, maritime oil and gas, you know, pretty much enterprise and then, you know, some uh, expats and um, private islands, things like that, and mm -hmm. private resorts and um, fishing lodges and that, and small communities, like we've done a couple of small communities in Africa. But the satellite owners pretty much don't take an interest in that. It takes a tremendous amount of customer service, okay. and they're not geared towards that. That's really fascinating. David? Yeah, I sort of texted an answer into the chat, but uh, personally, I, I don't see the Internet Society chapters um, in the places I work sort of actively engaging either with the satellite uh, community or the broader environmental community more generally. I think there's actually like a fundamental disconnect between uh, sort of the environmental groups and the Internet governance groups, uh, and this has to really be solved. Uh, I think the environmental groups have to learn to talk digital, and the digital groups need to learn to you know, think about environmental opportunities and risks. Um, and, it's, and, and what I'm happy to report is that at least at the global level and at, at some of the regional levels, those communities are actually now coming together. There's a, there's a process called the Internet Governance Forum uh, where environment is one of the four uh, top issues this year. Uh, and we'll be uh, launching a panel uh, to look at uh, the governance of environmental data. So I think these communities are coming together slowly um, but, you know, so far at the, at, the, at the ground level, I'm not seeing a, a huge amount of dialogue, even though there absolutely should be. Uh, and I'm happy, to, I'm happy that there is positive evolution in this front. I think one of the things to consider is if we think about digital transformation, it's really a lot of it's being driven by the ubiquity of smart devices, the, the mobile phone with much more uh, ability to do processing and authentication and display data and things. Um, but at the moment, that's not something that we directly serve from satellites, not at that level of, of capability. And it might be worth reflecting on, you know, if we are expecting these remote communities to be part of that digital future, they do need to have access to these devices, but they can't get the connectivity. Um, perhaps, perhaps, Sandeep, you could comment on the thing, because you do both the mobile networks and the satellite networks, where you think we might be able to get to with regard to uh, enablement and conjunction of these different technologies so people feel that they are really not second-class citizens but part of a global community uh, absolutely <clears throat> and, and look so i can i can quote an example right from from our country and from our, our own company uh, where we did use satellite to some extent to connect remote communities uh, but not to an extent that was done before and now we're exploring that you know, as it becomes more affordable, more more reliable, uh, the spread is more. 
uh, we are actually using satellite as a backhaul for our 4G and, and, and we are also now considering in certain islands of Australia using some other type of constellations like MEO constellations, you know, and, and, and carrying a lot of, a lot of data into those communities. And this is one of the only aspects, right? Uh, and the other point is, you know, can we can now actually deploy satellite for a backup for those, you know, main cell sites all over the country, because it, you know, it lends itself to do that. And, and, um, and the company and, and our network people are extremely aware about all the developments that are happening in the satellite industry, especially in the MEO and LEO sector, which, which you know, reduces the latency and the experience is almost similar that you will get in, in a city. You can uh, produce the same result in, in a remote area and even high altitude platforms. You know, they are part of the bigger, you know, even though they're not exactly satellites, but they kind of behave somewhat like a satellite. And they are also being considered as a part of overall network infrastructure uh, expansion into those remote communities. That's well, true. full connectivity for people is so 12 years ago. You know, the lack of full connectivity, um, it's been happening for quite a while. You use the satellite as the backbone, and you put up Wi-Fi networks, and there's SIP applications for your handheld phones. You're making phone calls immediately. It's just, you know, structuring it properly, putting the proper infrastructure, which is what used to cost um, – even if you want to put a private LTE in or do something with your own pseudo cellular type, what, what cost a million dollars went down to a hundred thousand dollars. What cost a hundred thousand dollars is now $20,000. And now there are five to $8,000 solutions for that for an entire infrastructure that's driven by satellite. Remember satellite never sleeps. I think Hank, that's really fascinating. I was going to, I was going to start to, to move in that direction. I think you've introduced it at the right time. Is actually the driving down of cost and the increase of capability, and and the increase of reach that comes then. Smaller and smaller communities being able to get access to uh, the global connectivity fabric. Um, you just reflect on where you think perhaps we might be going in. Well, we might see in in a few years' time. I'm going to come back to David in terms of in a moment with regard to how dense does that connectivity really need to be to make sure that it's accessible but not transforming and destroying societies but could you just reflect on the on the trends in in pricing and things where do you think we're going to get to i remember 28 years ago a vsat solution would i had to sell it for twenty thousand dollars and i couldn't make any money and i couldn't sell any today i sell it for about twelve hundred dollars i make a lot of money i sell a lot of them and people are very happy to provide wonderful connectivity. But the future of this, I see Leo, Mio, and Geo all converging together, along with 5G. And I, I will consider it, and I will coin it, a symphony in space, because we will all be interacting with each other. And we'll just be sitting there with a product like Data Dragon or something that can interface with all the different types of technologies to give everybody full connectivity around the planet. Oh, that's really beautiful. Uh, Sandy, do you want to give us your perspective before I ask David on, uh, to think about how dense? Yeah, look, so, so we, we've already talked about, you know, how you can, you can have this, you know, permanent sites um, using satellite as a backhaul. Now, obviously, there's a lot of work being done to integrate satellite with the handheld as well. So that's just a totally different aspect. It's not a visa industry, but there are, organization that are trying to do that right in different frequency bands um, but I was also going to quote an example of you know what Telstra uses in Australia and, and we sort of um, has a we have a pet name called sat cow which at least essentially sat, uh, stands for satellite cell on the wheels which we roll out for temporary you know requirements you know if, if you have a community that needs or, or there's an event and then you need mobile connectivity you just you know drag those trailers you know with on a four-wheel drive and leave it there for, for a couple of weeks or months and then you bring them back and take, take it to the next point uh, so, you know, it just sort of gives you that instant coverage or, you know, obviously there's a bit of planning involved, but, but now you are almost connecting where people are. So that's another example of, you know, how, how quickly it can spread. And I, I sort of talked about, you know, high altitude platforms. So that will probably, you know, once they become, uh, become mainstream, provide connectivity to any can, you know, small community that, that you don't even need satellite, you just put a high altitude platform and, and give them, you know, mobile connectivity. Okay. David, what's your thoughts then on, you know, really uh, enabling communities to be part of the, the, the global economic transformation? 
Well, the way where I see this moving is that everybody, I mean, clearly like digital infrastructure is a, is a core utility and a, almost a basic right for everybody. But from my side, looking at the sustainability question, you know, how can we begin to pipe uh, analytics about the environment and about the, the, the health of the local environment to every single mobile phone on the planet? In other words, how can everybody have a dashboard that opens up to say, look, Within the, you know, within the five mile radius of your house, here's the local air quality, here's the water quality, here is the situation with respect to forests, so that people have a real time snapshot of what's going on locally. And at the same time, those mobile phones are basically analyzing uh, their consumption patterns and saying, look, here's where you could actually uh, do better. You know, if you, if you traveled less or bought this or bought that, this would be the reduction of your footprint. So we need to get to a point where mobile phones are not only giving people information about their local environment, but also helping them actively make much better decisions about you know, their consumer behaviors. And if we, can get to, if we can get to that point where mobile phones are really actively helping us to be better consumers, I mean, that would be a huge step forward uh, for sustainability and for actually achieving some of these goals in the next 10 years. Okay, that's really fascinating. Um, in fact, the uh, sell on wheels thing has come up with a comment um, uh, about that really being an important aspect to augment connectivity for its responders. But there's actually two really fascinating questions I think are really in the core of, of, of the topic today, um, which relate to the aspect that a large, um, a large percentage of the global community uh, really are not only non-connected, they're unbanked. They don't have ability to, to actually transact and, and recognize the, the uh, the value of their contribution to society in a, in a way that's sustainable um, and I just you know could you reflect on on that perhaps as a panel you know what does it take to to bring something to those people can we do it let me uh but one of our I'm going to call it it's just it's part of our culture what we do isotropic is we're not we don't look at demand as, as a business we don't look at what's the demand for satellite we look at the need. We're a needs-based company, a needs-based culture. So we, when we look at the commercial aspect of it, how is our service going to help this prospect or this customer make money? So we look at the same thing. When we did this little experiment, you call it, in Alaska, said, how can we help them improve their lives and their lives aren't going to improve really that much unless they can make money. They have to be sustainable. So we looked at what they had for a product, what, the, what their local resources were, the natural resources. And I'm not going to, I don't want to use the word exploit because these are people that do not like to be exploited, but they do love the commerce that they've generated and it's improved lives. I think maybe we need some organization to go out there and say, how can digitalization of these communities, of these countries, of these continents improve people's lives? Just like David said, you know, when once these cellular phones, these handhelds become more intelligent, everyone becomes more intelligent. You know, we have to look at things like multicast and get the information to everybody right away. So maybe they don't even have to look at a dashboard. It pops up for them automatically. So I think that's something that's really challenging. You know, to, one of the reasons people don't have a bank account is that they can't provide that identity, that that kind of, this is me, this is, and this is how you can can interact with me. And, and so maybe some of these more um, community-driven approaches where there is local uh, respect and identity, and maybe some of the digital mechanisms that we have for doing uh, micropayments and transactions on mobile phones or using... Uh, the kind of digital ledger technologies could be interesting. I don't know whether panels think about that. Is that something that we could see happen over the next few years? We need an enabler of finance and telecoms working together. Blockchain is going to be huge. It is going to be the next great technology. Huge. Yeah. Sandy? 
Yeah, so look, I mean, even though, you know, Australia is in a different sort of environment, you know, we already have those things, but, you know, just from a personal um, experience, you know, I can quote some some countries, especially in developing countries, you know, it, it is a big thing, you know, in India and in Papua New Guinea, you know, when, when, when the new 3G, 4G signal started, you know, the whole digital economy changed, you know, a lot of those transactions were done to transfer money from bank accounts, you know, which, which couldn't be done before. And in fact, you know, somebody actually told me, and it was quite surprising, you know, um, you know, looking at uh, from a from developed country point of view, that uh, when the new uh, mobile operator started in Papua New Guinea, for example, you know, a few years ago, uh, the sale of Coca Cola actually dropped, and and they did a big research to find out why did it drop because people had limited money to spend, and they were rather spending money on buying you know prepaid cards for mobile phones rather than spending on Coca Cola, so you know it, it was just just an an anecdotal example, but you know people did benefit you know from 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 uh, you know as the as the as the mobile signal expanded and a lot of uh, you know money to sort of tra- transfer took place on using using uh, using phones. That's fascinating. There's a comment actually uh, from Renato Godfellow, good Goodfellow on, on that. He was basically saying the same sort of thing that uh, really it's an enabler for micro payments as well and, and inclusive uh, as, as a consequence. Um, so I just uh, maybe there's a uh, David. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to point out on this question of ID, this is a huge issue. The, the UN and the World Bank uh, have an initiative uh, t- together called uh, ID4D, which is Identification for Development, where they're looking to determine how they can basically use digital technologies uh, to offer identification for a billion people and how do you, you know, how do, you do that in a way that protects them. Um, and one of the things they're trying is the, is the, the challenge, right? Um, how do we have a prize and how do we basically set a series of problems to solve and then and then bring in uh, different teams to try to solve those problems. So that that uh, ID4D challenge is ongoing right now. And I believe the winners uh, are, are going to be selected very soon. Uh, but if you're looking, if, if colleagues are interested in this question of digital ID and, and what the UN and World Bank are doing, uh, that's certainly a good resource to have a look at. So it's ID4D. Oh, thanks for that pointer. That's really, I'm sure people will be looking that up right now. Um, I think one of the considerations here is if you look at 5G and its deployment, it's initially going to be in the urban areas because that's where the investment can pay dividends. But if we put 5G and satellite together as a capability where it might be low cost access devices and, and increased utility and induced intelligence on the edge, does 5G sat- but satellite and satellite together actually help to remove those barriers and increase? Uh, Increase the sort of global access. Well, there will never ever be enough bandwidth. So 5G, especially in urban areas, is going to be um, incredibly popular and great demand for it. Uh, the satellite play there is providing more content to 5G. You know, we'll have caching servers at the cell towers so that people can get their content quicker and are not. The, the terrestrial carriers not using up all their bandwidth, a backbone, just to get content to the towers. It can come in another manner and it can get to every tower at the same time. So it gives them consistency, you know, certainty that everything arrives at the same time. So there's going to be a big 5G satellite play. So they will We're be. Right now with uh, smaller regional carriers. Sandy? Yeah, look, so in fact, I was actually reading, um, you know, the Satellite Industry Association uh, in Asia actually launched a white paper about satellite and 5G, you know, is it competing is or is it complementing each other, you know, because there is a bit of, you know, you hear two different stories, right? They, you know, the one story that is definitely coming up is, is the spectrum grab, you know, I wish I should not use the term grab because, you know, it, it, because for, for our company, you know, we are in two, two um, camps already, right? We have a 5G uh, uh, vision and then we also have a bit of a small satellite vision as well but generally yes I would definitely agree with, with Hank you know apart from certain um, uh, millimeter wave band where uh, the, the spectrum is required for both services apart from that I think they are very complementary to each other and and the fastest way to grow is through satellites you know and especially now with the advent of new kind of uh, you know low altitude satellites that makes a lot more sense to into to back all 5G on that. And there was a comment online about 4G perhaps being the right technology for wide areas combined with satellite. And maybe we'll see all different technologies being used at the end of the day. People don't care how they're connected. They just need to be connected. Um, I think there's, there's, there's only time for a couple more questions. There's two left on. Um, 
I'm going to ask them both actually, but then I'd like to keep it really short answers and then I'd like each of you to give a sense of where do you think the future is going to be in five years? But one of those actually that uh, might reflect on this was how do you view the recent consolidations and plans of satellite operators and service providers for mobility affecting the markets? And specifically, what will that look like? Well, how will it affect small and medium sized service providers? Do you think this is this brings new opportunities or is it a risk that we'll get consolidation and then and then we won't get the diversity in the reach so hank that one that's one for you i think there's there's nothing but an opportunity out there um there's been a lot of consolidation and you know one of the companies that tried to consolidate a lot of service providers was unsuccessful with it you, you know you need to be methodical about your approach you need to pay attention to the client and you have to know who you are don't ever forget where you came from. Forget where you came from, you'll never get to where you're going. That's very important. Um, it, as far as the future, as I, as I mentioned before, I see a symphony in space. That's, that's, that's really, really beautiful. Um, uh, Sandy, just any, any thoughts on, on the kind of consolidation and new actors and what it might do for, for Telstra's business? And, yeah, look, I mean, so everyone knows that there's a lot of big players now coming into, into satellite marketing, which we, we, the name that you never saw before, you know, the Amazons, the Microsofts now, the re recent announcement. So uh, probably more, more of my personal views, but yes, I, I think they, there may be some sort of consolidation, uh, uh, which is required because it is very fragmented, especially in Asia. Uh, and with the with all these big operators coming in, they bring in a big value add. It is not just about pro, you know providing you know underlying connectivity. Actually, they are overlaying a whole infrastructure of cloud and, and and distributing that. So I think there might be some sort of consolidation that might happen in the in the satellite industry. Uh, but you know, companies will generally benefit. You know, so I think you know even telcos like us are benefiting from that. And small ISPs they are creating lots more product that are easier to sell and easier to integrate. So I think everyone will benefit from that, you know, service providers and, and customers alike. So actually, uh, David, maybe the last question that's up on the panel is, it links to this because it does consider how industry uh, uh, respond to and respect and engage with the wider uh, societies. And it relates to the, to the fact the World Economic Forum has launched a set of 21 stakeholder capitalism metrics to show how climate is doing on climate change and biodiversity. Um, but there's a, a, a link on the question, which is actually about how to gather the data and how to engage, provide connectivity that really provides us uh, the, those, those insights, but also helps those developing economies uh, to, to become part of mainstream. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, I, first of all, I want to say I, I think the, uh, the, the capitalism metrics are fantastic. And that's exactly what something that I was talking about in my opening about looking at supply chains and making supply chains and the performance of companies uh, much more transparent and really trying to measure what they're doing to, to achieve the SDGs. So I think a metric like this is really important to bring transparency to their performance. I think the, what's fundamental is getting the, the quality of the data uh, secured. We really need to understand where that data is coming from uh, and, and how to ensure that it is high quality so that mistakes uh, are not made. And increasingly, I think this this will become more and more automated. You know, I think that as supply chains uh, take on, uh, start using digital technologies, uh, the data feeds will be become increasingly automated, and and uh, uh, and so the quality issues won't be as um, as uh, well. They're still germane, but it'll be much more easy to to begin to look at these metrics and begin to measure the performance of a product or a company across its entire supply chain. Uh, so I think this is definitely the way to go. I'm really happy to see the WEF doing uh, this kind of work. And I, you know, I fundamentally believe that, as I said, when I opened these, these fundamental questions that we're trying to, to solve, this 10 year window, this is only gonna happen if public and private sectors collaborate and figure out where our comparative advantage lies, right? And the public, the public sector and private sector have a fundamental uh, roles to play in, in coming up with these uh, solutions and in working together uh, against you know climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. So, uh, the more we can collaborate, the more we can uh, come up with uh, you know uh, solutions that work for both, uh, the better. So I'm all in favor. Thank you. And we've only got time for a last word each. Maybe what in your in your summing up, you can touch on something that's not 
trend, but a shock to the system as well, um, with regard to the pandemic and the effect it's having, and and perhaps what uh, whether that would would influence what you see it happening over the next few years. So I'm going to start with you, Hank. You've got a, you've got a few seconds left to to give you uh, your your perspective on this. We believe in resilience. We were taught to be resilient as children. It's uh, part of our culture in the company also. We can take a punch and we can bounce back. Thank you, Hank. Sandy. Yeah, so, so we see these trends, you know, going after this COVID-19 restriction and, and uh, you know, once they're in place, I think people are getting used to more connectivity, more digitization. And I think the trends are gonna go up. Yeah, I don't see it going back at all. Uh, David. I think the, the big challenge is this going back to the data governance question. And if we don't solve that data governance question and, and, and make sure that the public is trusting uh, the, the international framework for governing data, whatever kind, that could get some uh, serious pushback. And I, and I think we have to solve that question if we're going to continue to use digital technologies to respond to existential threats like COVID or anything else. We need to sort out you know, that these, these data governance questions as a matter of priority. Thank you very much. Um, so from me, I think we've covered, just to, to reflect, we've covered an awful lot of ground today. We've covered uh, the whole aspect of digital transformation, not only the things that are happening in, in the, the developed world, but also the potential for bringing uh, communities together and using satellites and terrestrial systems working in harmony. And, and we've also looked at some of these tough aspects, tough questions about automation and artificial intelligence and, and the governance of data. So I, it only leaves me to, to thank you all. Uh, and I think I, if, if people were here, they would be giving you a standard ovation now. So I'd like to give you all thanks for me, thanks from all of our audience, and uh, look forward to, to seeing this future come to life. Uh, the, the symphony in space, as Hank would call it. I think that's a great, great phrase. And we'll, we'll be repeating that everywhere we go. So thank you all, and uh, look forward to, to seeing you again sometime.